All right, welcome back to Spiritual Hustlers Podcast. Today, I have an incredible guest, Anthony Trucks. He's a family man, entrepreneur, motivational speaker. He's all of it. He's like the real deal, and I'm really glad that I had an opportunity to drop in with him and develop a relationship over the last couple of years. And he is here to talk about what does it mean to be spiritual hustler? What does it mean to actually be a family man, be an entrepreneur, and how to juggle all those balls? We were just dropping in before before the podcast. He has a lot to share. He has great energy, and I'll let him take it away. Take it away. Hey, what are we gonna talk about? Where do you want me to go with it? Man, Let's go I want to I wanna hear I want to hear your story. I want to hear your My story. story. Tell, tell the that? audience about how did you end up know. at this spot? You know, there there's so many there's so yeah. much noise in the world right now, and you're yeah kind of ascending over that noise and doing your thing, crushing it. You're, you know, when we, people say I'm a, I'm a serial entrepreneur, he's yeah, like yeah. actually the real one, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm doing a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that happens, man. So yeah, dude, I guess the way I, I'll explain it is, man, I, I start in a funky place and we got somewhere else. I don't like to call it like, it's like a rags or riches story, but like, that's what people call it. It's not, it's not like this. Cause I don't Zero think Richard. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you can call it, that's a better way to put it. I like that. It sounds cleaner. What it turns out is like at three years old, I was given away into foster care. And essentially my biological mom, she didn't want me, her, my siblings, and gave us all into a system that was really heinous. And man, like he's bad, get beaten, starved, tortured. It's pretty much like if, if I don't die, they get a paycheck. So they just didn't treat me well, but I didn't die, right? So I had some really traumatic experiences growing up just evil people, man, beaten, starved, tortured, a whole bunch of odd things. And then I ended up in a family, which is my current family. But the unique thing is I'm the only black person in an all white family. So I grew up in this dynamic of not knowing where I fit, not understanding how to navigate the, they call it the waters of the world. And so as I kind of went through this whole process, I was just kind of never really knowing who I was. I never had this anchoring like I am X. I didn't know my identity. And in this family, I was there for 11 years, actually eight more years, 11 years in a system before I was adopted at 14. At 14, I knew for the first time, this place that I woke up, I get to go to bed tonight. Like, this is my home now, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a unique feeling to, to not get till 14. And so for me, if you've ever felt in your life like you didn't matter, didn't belong, you feel unstable, that was my upbringing. Like, that was my, I guess, development as a young man. And so I went into this world where statistically, people don't know this, but in foster care, 75% of prison inmates in American prisons are former foster kids. That's crazy, Half man. the homeless population, former foster kids, less than 1% of us ever graduate from college. And there's hundreds of thousands of us. So statistically, the moment my mom gave me away, I was put into a really bad bubble of like, I wasn't supposed to do well. So I get to the point where I'm now 14, I, I get adopted, I get to play the sport, which is amazing. I never played before. I wanted to play, but wasn't allowed to because of foster care. Uh, but I got to play football, man. I could go out and hit people and not get in trouble. And I loved it. Like, <laughs> I, the idea was a great, like, mm, I loved it. However, I was horrible at it. Like, I was, like, ridiculous, like, not good at all, man. So what ends up happening, AJ, is I'm in a situation where now I'm, I'm trying this thing I want to do and be good at, but I have the pain of not being good at it. You know what I'm saying? And we all have that in some capacity. We're like, I'm gonna try this thing. I'm gonna do this. And I go, oh, uh, you know, this, this sucks a little bit. It this isn't hurts. I don't feel good, right. And so what I do is I'll typically remove myself from that because I don't want to endure that same emotional feeling. So I did that. I checked out of football after two years. I'm like, I'm done doing this. My adoptive mom was diagnosed with MS. My older brother, I'm one of six. He's like my rock. He's off in the military. I'm floating. And I remember I checked out. I was like, I'm done with football. And I had this moment where just these two girls were talking and one girl said to the other one in the class, no idea I'm listening. She says, well, the reason I'm so bad is because I'm in foster care. It was a simple statement, but it was like a gift because it was my excuse for quitting said out loud. So I'm like, oh, like, I don't want to have that be some I say later on. So I'm like, ah, and it unsettled me. So I remember going home that night and like, I got to find a way to be great. And so the only way I knew to be great was at football. So I tried this new this new perspective of how I can I I'd be great at football. And what I did was I went and I just did everything a great football player does, dude. And, and what I did in that seven from like 15 years old to 16 years old changed my life. And not because I got good at a football game. Let's make sure it's clear. Had nothing to do with the football. Football was the vessel to have this process take place. Mm -hmm. It's what I call an identity shift. I didn't know what I was doing, but I went through this process of, of executing in a direction that caused me pain so like fiercely and so consistently that when I was done and I came the next season, 
I was a great football player. Now, whether or not you would have said I was didn't matter. I internally had this identification and belief I was great. I had done far too much in the dark to not have what I desired and deserved in the light. That was my mentality. And so I went through this whole process, man, and, and I pushed through, and that turned into me coming. I was actually, I'm not going to lie, I got pretty damn good. I really was good. <laughs> I got a college scholarship to play football at the University of Oregon, had a kid at 20 years old, met my dad at 20 years old, uh, ended up, you know, actually ended end that time, like four years later, married my high school sweetheart, who would actually come to college with me. Um, after three years in the NFL, I got in the NFL after three years, tore my shoulder, came home lost myself had no clue who I was I was always scattered trying to find out my identity started a gym business that didn't go very well I still had it in place but it was just always struggling my marriage fell apart I got out of shape I wasn't a good dad we had two more kids so three kids were like a crappy dad and dude I was just like in a fog and my mom she unfortunately she loses a 17 year battle with MS and it was one of those moments where it's like man I'm, I'm living this life and I'm not fulfilling in my full potential that this lady helped me I'd be able to do like without her, man, I'm a crazy statistic. I'm a bad kid, but she loved mm -hmm. me past my crazy. And so I was like, I got to figure this out. And I promise I said, I'm going to figure my life out, my first promise. And then what I do when it takes place, I'm going to find a way to do for the world what you did to me. Love unconditionally. I wasn't her blood. She had to do anything for me. So I figured out how to do all this stuff. And it took me three years to really figure it out. I'm not going to lie. Really figure it out. But when I did, Dude, I got my marriage back together after three years divorced. I got in better shape. Kids of a present dad. Everything went smooth. And I got life like back on track. And then it was like, all right, how do I make this, this thing of a second promise come to life and actually serve the world with this stuff? And that I happened across literally two months after my mom died, I happened across this world. So I was just like, at the time was kind of delving into it. I didn't really dig in properly. But when I made this commitment, man, I dug in and I've spent the last, I don't know, better part of like five plus years, just serving, like telling this story, figuring out how I can guide people through the process, like making sure there's takeaways and tangible nuances. But man, the rest of my life, I'm blessed to now get to, to make good on promise too. That's what I'm doing here, man. Man, that's beautiful. What a story. God damn. So there are so many rabbit mm -hmm. holes that I don't want to dive into with you, man. First trauma, pain threshold, uh, then identity, these these three wh where do you want to start where do you want uh, to leave dude, with that? you oh man what's the, <laughs> what's the what's the choices again bro i can go anywhere man, with it man pay threshold first of all so um pain that's threshold. that's okay. something that you see let's over that. yeah let's do let's that, do that. Pain over threshold. the let's lifetime about... we have we have so many opportunities yeah. to actually face that pain and most yep. of us shy away from it so do. how do you develop that pain threshold i don't know if you develop it but you understand it i think I, I'm a, this makes sense I always experience whenever I try something new, that same pain. And I've experienced it over and over. When I was 15 years old, I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I leaned into it. And then I have this, at this point in my life, I have a palpable, like I, I can taste pain, it, if it makes sense. Like difficulty, it, it tastes good. It's a really, cra it's a creepy, weird thing, dude. I don't tell people this a lot. My head is a, is a, a circus. But when things are difficult, I can taste it. Like I salivate at it. And here's the big thing why. I realized that the moment you try something for the first time, you get a 10 of pain and it hurts. It's the first speech, the first podcast, the first book, it's the first love, it's, it's a, it hurts, right? And then what happens is most people, they feel that and go, ooh, I don't like that, and they walk away. And now what happens is they still have a desire to do it, but they just don't. So they make excuses, procrastinate, they, but they always have a regret. Mm -hmm. For me, what I realized is the moment that I, I had that first setback, I had an amazing lesson right there. And if I walk away, I lose a lesson because the next time I try again, six months from now, and I forgot what the hell happened, right? But those who are successful do this. Let's say I go on stage, I bomb it. I do a 10 of 10 pain, they're throwing eggs at you. Where's the last place you want to go, AJ? Back on the stage. Yeah, back, back on the stage. Yeah. I don't want to go back. Why would Actually, I, go there? I wish they threw eggs at me. Then it's, I think it would be easier because it'd be less painful <laughs> than just, just that silence. I think yeah, it'd, be less, you know I'd be, I'd be less, it'd be less painful. Yeah, <laughs> It would be one of those things. Like what if some like nobody clapped, but like there's pain. And so most people go, I don't want to feel that I'm not ever going on a stage. And I'm like, ah, all right. I love what happened. Someone goes, you didn't do da, da, da. Oh, you know what? All right. Let's go back out and try it. And people are like, what you again? Yeah. You just bombed it. I know, but now I know something to make it better. So I'll go back up and I may fix that one thing. So now it's like a nine of 10. It's still painful, 
But like mm-hmm. I do it and then I get off. People go, bro, why you keep doing that? You suck. And I'm gonna do it again. Do it again? What are you talking about? Yeah, but I know, I know another thing now. So I keep going back and it's an eight and it's a seven and it's a six. The pain threshold, I don't know if the pain diminishes, but I get better, I get stronger, so I don't feel it as much, right? And it's still the same kind of problems. But eventually what happens is we get to that zero. I work my way down and most people assume that it's zero, it's painless. But painless, I don't care about painless. Like, all right, mm-hmm. painless. You know what I would like to do though is when I get to that level of zero, it's not zero, it's joy. The thing I hated to do, I love now. And genuine, I'm talking about my story. When I first started speaking, I, I didn't want to, at stages, bro, I used to go bomb. I used to go talk at parks, elementary schools, little kids wouldn't listen to me, you know what I mean? And I was like, I don't want to do this. Bro, now I get like paid like $25,000 for a keynote and I love it. Bro, put me on, not even about the money. It's about the aspect of like, I get to go and have a blast up there. I love it. And it's only because of my pain threshold early on. It's not, when it's down here, it's easy. When it's painless, anybody does it. But no one gets through that threshold to get to that zero. So for me, I, I don't know if there's anything like, yeah, I feel the pain. But I think because I know I'm going to get past it quicker, it's like a pick, a, a pinprick, you know? I know it's going to hurt at first, but after the needle goes in, like, I don't feel I'm taking blood. I, mm-hmm. I feel it first, then it's smooth. So many people are afraid of that, that jolt of pain that they'll never get to that painless place. And they live a life of just anguish, and they have an enduring pain of regret. Man. That's a perfect segue into identity because most people identify with that pain and they kind of live as it's that pain defines, starts defining them. So let's dive into identity because you said, you still said, um, I'm one of those people. When you were talking about you being a foster, a foster kid, you said, I am one of those people. So you're still identifying with it, but you're not limiting yourself to that single identity. How does that work? So we have multiple identities, man. Like the cool thing is two parts. One, you have multiple identities and they come. So for example, I am not the exact same guy in my relationship, say in the bedroom than I am when I'm at work. It'd be weird. You know what I mean? I'd be like, what's up, AJ? How you doing, baby? Like, you know what I'm saying? There's different identities. I'm not the same guy on a football field as I am um, on a basketball court. It can't be. I would tackle people. You see what I'm saying? We have different identities. Also, no matter what identity you have, you're not suck to that one. You aren't confined. It's not set in stone, right? And I think people think that whoever I am, this is just who I am. Do you got to put up with me? No, no. Because that's who you are. That you're committed to being that person that I'm not committed to being in your life. Because that person can do some different stuff. You can operate different. You can think different, process different, handle situations different. You can learn differently. You can do vastly different things. So what that tells me is you're not, this isn't who you are until you're choosing to be. So if you choose to be this person, what if you choose to be somebody else? And when I say choose to be someone else, it's not choose to, uh, to have a different job. It's not choose to pick, wear a different shirt. It's choose to internally be a different person who lives a different way of life. And that identity you can shape and craft and live into. And it's not an overnight thing. We're not talking about I choose today and I wake up tomorrow like, oh, I'm a pastor today. No, man. You got work to do. But the idea is if you are committed to having this this better life in some capacity, the way you lean into it isn't by simply saying like, I don't want to, I don't want to be here anymore. I want something different and expecting it to happen by doing the same things. You got to do different and doing different is way easier when you internally become somebody different. Right? So simple example, like I happen, like maybe I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a dad now. Before this, I did, I couldn't identify as a dad before I had a kid. I'm just a guy. Uh, you a dad? No, I'm not a dad. If I saw a dad, you'd be like, you, ain't a, you got any kids? No, you ain't a dad. What are you talking about, right? But then I have a kid. And you'd think, oh, you're a dad now. Yeah, but do I feel like a dad right now? No, I just had a kid. I don't, I'm not a, how do I identify as a dad? He's brand, he's a newborn, right? Mm-hmm. Here's what happens. After one year of changing diapers, two years changing diapers, poop, crying in the middle of the night, kid gets sick, they bust their kneecap, all these things, right? You better believe I am a dad now. I've done the work. I've shown up day after day after day. I'm a dad, dude. You can't take it from me. And that identity was not crafted overnight. It took time to build into it. But at this point, like, dude, I'm at my core dad. And I couldn't tell you what day it happened, but I built into it. Mm. Now, if I, if I didn't, I would be a bad dad. I'd be, I'd be just a dude that has a kid somewhere. You know what I mean? And I think if people can look at this perspective and go, oh, well, that's happened 
in many parts of my life. I wasn't a student. Now I'm a college student. Now I'm a, I have a job and I have a career. Now I'm a husband, I'm a wife, or I'm, a, I'm an auntie or auntie or uncle. Like there's different parts. These are happening every day in life. The problem is AJ, no one's thinking about them when they do, they just fall into it. But like, if you can step in and go, I want to choose who I want to be for maybe the first time ever. And then you shift into that. The cool thing is that person comes with the things that you want to have. That's like a different tangent, we'll call it. But uh-huh. at the end of the day, man, whenever I want something more, it's not, it's not what I need to know to get there. It's not the connections. It's who am I? Because if I'm that person, you'd, you'd be surprised at how smooth you flow into having that thing. That's why people that make their first couple million, where I call it, how, they're not going to stay broke there. There are very few people that know how to make a million dollars that don't ever make a million dollars, even if they lose it, because that, that's a they're different kind of person now. Right. There's just some nuances in there. And I, I'm going in tangents because it's later in the evening, my time. My brain's already went through the sauce of this. But I'm telling you, at the end of the day, your identity isn't set in stone. You get to choose exactly what it is. And your identity does not have to be the same across all tangents of life. Hmm. Word, man. That's, that's powerful. That's powerful. And that's, that's something that you mentioned was intention. The intentionality of building that certain identity. You see, um, something that really... Is a, is a question mark for me because most people don't know who they are and who they want to be. And True. so how do, you, how do you actually identify with something? Who do you latch on to? It's like, where do you yeah. start? Like a person in, in that darkness, it's like you were one of those people who was in the darkness and then you, you were living from a place of light. Most people identify yeah. with that darkness and it overtakes them. So it's like, how do yeah. you, how is it different? How is it different for, for most, most of the population? But you stepped out of, stepped out of that darkness, identified with the light. How do you do that? Yeah. Well, the, well, there's actually one, two, th- there's three pieces of this. The first thing is knowing where you're at, right? Who you are. The second portion is knowing where you want to go. The third part's the, the path to get there. This can all be looked at, we'll call it metaphorically, like a GPS. If I, if I want to go from, from where I'm at to where you're at in Bali right now, there's a GPS, right? I can say, okay, I'm starting here so the GPS can find me. And then it's going to have the destination, right? Then there's a whole plan in between. That plan can be vastly different, right? I could take a a bicycle to the dock to get in a boat and go across. I can take a car to the airport, fly over to you. I can take a boat from there, a bike from there, a a car from all these things, right? And so what I look at is like, let's think about this in a life term. A lot of people right now, for being honest, they don't actually know where they're at. They, They know that what they're doing but a lot of us have these massive blind spots that we either don't want to listen to or we don't even know exists. We, it's, the, it's the unknown, right? I don't know. I don't know it. That's so something, for, what am I pretending not to see? One of my favorite questions to ask. What am I pretending yeah. not to see? So how are, you, how are you identifying? Because most of us delude into the stories, right? Delude ourselves into stories and identifying with, okay, I just, I just don't know. I'm lost. Yeah, we'll say that. No, and the, the I'm lost is an ego checkout. Because what happens if I accept it, my ego has to be torn apart to accept the work on it. So most people will not give themselves permission to improve because they won't give themselves permission to suck. Like, I just don't, I don't want to admit that I'm not. Here's the funny thing. People go like, I'm not perfect, but go and try to tell them something. They're, they're always perfect now. Oh, I don't got that problem. That's, I'm not dealing with that. You just said you weren't perfect. So where are you not perfect? You know what I mean? Like it's, it's weird, but that's what happens. So the first thing is find out where you're at. I have whole processes I use to figure out what your current identity is, or what phase you're in. So that exists. But once you figure out where you're at, it's like, okay, cool. And typically when you do it, it does, although it hurts to see like, oh, I got to work on that. Uh-huh. It gives you hope to see a place you can go in the future. That's more inspiring than where you're going now. Most people don't have an inspirational end destination. They just say, I want more money. I want a nicer house. I want more freedom. But what does that look like? Do you want to have, do you want to make $200,000 a year? Do you want to live in a place where, you know, the the cost of living is low? Uh, Is freedom to you picking your kids up at school and dropping them off? Is freedom, you can go, you can live in a different country. What what is freedom to you, right? What what does, you know, a, a nice house look like? Is that, are you living on a boat? Are you living in a condo in a sky rise? Tell me something. Because if it ain't specific, then you're not going to actually be excited to get there. It just won't even, it won't tickle you the way it needs to in the morning when you don't want to get up to make you get up. That's that's the second piece. Where am I going? The one you asked was more so about the the path in between, we'll call it. And that path in between is like, yeah, if I'm in a dark space, how do I come to the light? 
what it simply boils down to is this process in the statement that I call creation. And what is it? It's what you create creates you. So let's say, for example, I am one identity and I want to be and shift into a new one. I have to create that identity inside brick by brick, which is day by day, action by action, failure by failure, success by success. And the way it typically works is I sit back and go, all right, I'm starting here. And the identity I want to get to is that one. And I'm in what's called the gap. It's an identity gap between who I am, who I want to be. There's a gap right here. The way I close this gap is by making this shift through actions every day. And it's usually towards something I don't feel confident about. So let's use an example of um, maybe I've been living a dark life. I've been robbing people, doing drugs, you know, sleeping around, whatever it is. But I want to be a person, man, I want to be a priest. Make it something up, right? Okay. So you're not going to wake up in the alley with needles hanging out of your arm and you're stuck inside some woman going, I'm going to be a priest. You know, that's not how it works. What you do is get up and go, okay, I'm going to get clean first. That's a process. You're creating this. And it, you know the creation. It's, it's hard, man. It's, I have the shakes and I get sick, but I'm sticking to it. And then I come out of that and I go, man, I'm, I'm recovered. Like I'm clean. You own that. I'm, I'm a, you know, I, I don't do drugs. Not I'm trying to quit. I don't do drugs. Different identity. Then you go, you know what? I really want to learn more about faith. I don't, I don't know anything about the Bible. So what do I do? I go read the Bible, man. Maybe I go, I go study it and I start taking like the hours and hours and weeks and months really getting into it. And I go, okay, I feel like I have a grasp of this, the scripture a little bit more, right? I understand a little bit more what this means. And then that's one thing for yourself. Now you're going to say, man, I, I want to go tell other people about this. Well, I got to start by telling other people. Maybe I go and I talk to schools or talk to organizations. I go and volunteer at a, a, you know, some organization where I can spend time in, in conversation and discipling, right? And after a while, then you become the, this person that goes, you know what? I feel confident in saying I could be a priest. And then whatever it takes to do that, you may do that or a pastor, right? But the idea is like that process to come from dark to light, it doesn't happen overnight. And every single day you get a stack of brick, but here's what happens. If I got clean, if I read the Bible, if I went and served and everything, there, there's a different sense of confidence inside of me that goes, I am this person now. Mm -hmm. I deserve this goal. And I think that last piece, deserving of the goal, is a really big thing people don't understand. And what I want to anchor this whole thought to is this. We as humans will fight for what we deserve. We all will. And that even means if I think what I deserve is down here. We fight to stay small. Because if I didn't do the work in the dark to, to be able to shine the light, when that opportunity comes, I don't want anybody to find out that I didn't earn it. So I'll fight to stay here. So I'll make an excuse. I'll procrastinate. I'll self-sabotage to fight for what I think I deserve. So I stay comfortable. But if I know what I deserve is up here, you better believe I ain't staying down here. I will fight and, and by tooth and nail and scratch and cut you to get what I know I deserve. Hey, if we're, AJ, if we're at a birthday party and I want some cake, and I, and I earn the cake and you eat my cake, bro, we're fighting because that's my cake. I deserve the cake. I know I earned the cake. You know what I'm saying? But if I know I didn't earn the cake and who wants the last piece and you take it, I'd be like, yeah, I know I didn't deserve that piece of cake. It's that simple, but it's also applied to many parts of life people don't see. That's beautiful, man. That's super powerful. And I want to I want to take that in a slightly different, uh, different angle. Uh, so people who actually study who put in the work, who ascend that identity that they, they had in the past. And they're going, they're, they're creating something. They keep learning. They keep mm -hmm. accumulating that knowledge, but they don't feel like they learned enough. Imposter syndrome uh, creeps in and they're not able to express. It's kind of, it becomes an addiction to like hoarding your knowledge and not sharing it. So you're hoarding everything inside and you're not sharing that with the world. And that's, I see, I see a lot of that in amongst coaches, uh, people who are actually trying to help others, but they, they don't feel like they're enough. They don't feel like they can help others with the current knowledge that they have. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's hoarding, but it's, I think it's what they end up doing is they think, what if somebody who knows more than me outs me? And that's what I've noticed. People are like, oh, I don't want to say anything because somebody else that might know more than me might come out and look, say, I don't know anything. You know what I mean? Like, it's just weird. I think we'll call it imposter syndrome, but it's a fear of judgment, I think is what it boils down to. So I do learn a bunch of stuff and then I don't get the full benefit of it all. I think there's an, as a, a much greater benefit to actually sharing and educating people, even if it's a personal experience and like feeling amazing because all of a sudden I shared something that people enjoyed and I'm missing out on the true like depth. Like if I knew all the stuff I know, I spent, as you can tell, 
I spend a lot of time thinking. I think a lot. I sit in my head and I drive in the car and I think a lot and I take a bunch of notes because I'm always like, how can I explain this to people? It would not be as fulfilling to have these thoughts and then not share them. So if I hoard it to myself, I'm limiting the experience emotionally I can get from knowing what I know. So simply having like these thoughts and then sharing them, people go, oh, wow, that helped me a lot. I did a presentation a day for an hour. I got a ton of different messages and I, I love that. I love that the, the weird things that I've come up with in my brain that I send out into the world, people go, man, that helped me. Dude, I love that. So why would I hoard that? And some people do. And I think the big thing is I don't mind sharing this. For example, I'm going to be... I'm going to be down in a couple of weeks with like the godfather of his whole entire industry, Mr. Robbins, right? And, and I know I'm going to be on a stage talking with him in the area. It's very odd, but think about this. Most people would never think about this. Mm. I'm going to go up there. And when I'm there, there's one or two people that go out on that stage. One person goes out and they go out and they wonder the entire time, what's he thinking of what I'm saying? What's he thinking of what I'm saying? And they're worried about what he might say afterwards because they look up and, and I get that. But for me, I'm going to do me. Because here's what I know. If I go out there and question, I'm not going to be fully me. And then if I do get feedback from that individual, it's going to crush me because I'm, I'm predicating my whole value base in that person. And the reality is it's just one human being. It's not the end of the world, right? It could be valuable for somebody. But what I do is I say, I'm going to go do me, man. I'm going to do whatever I do. Now, if I come off and he loves it, great. But I have a vastly better shot at him liking it if I am just me, unfiltered, without worrying about somebody. And I also know that if I go there and he doesn't like it, it doesn't mean it's the end of me. It just means that one person didn't like my thing, right? Mm. But I'm not going to hide it out of fear of somebody I look up to not liking it because at the end of the day, that's just one human. It's just one viewpoint. And it doesn't mean that you're not capable, right? It's this, it's this weird, I think, vision that people have in their head of like perfection. Like it doesn't exist. Right. And the best shot you got at, at being great is sharing everything you got without worrying about what somebody thinks about it because as much as people won't like it, a ton of people will. That's a massive shift though, man, because that's, that's not common because most, most people actually put, I have done that in the past, put coaches, put someone I look up to on a pedestal, like someone yeah. they, they, they're for some reason, I made this, uh, created this belief that they're more capable than I am. They're more just lucky than I am. They're smarter than I am. So how do you mm -hmm. actually, as you said, it's just one human being. And how do you actually navigate that when you're, you, you can still look up to them but not mm -hmm. idolize them. You see, there's, yeah, a, well, there's, a, there's a massive difference. So how do you, how do yeah. you dance with that? So I played the NFL and, and that was my first entrance in like being around these, these guys and that were just, you know, bigger than life. I'm five lockers down from Big Ben, who's one of the biggest, you know, best linebacker quarterbacks in, in the, the world, literally. And so, yeah, like you, you look at it and go, man, I don't want to look bad. These are people, but what if, what if they, they think something of me? And there's, there's one part is like, they, they're just humans. They're right. just people, you know, at the end of the day, they, they poop in the same toilet. They put the same pants on They, you know, they're still the same people. And, and that's one part is like, I can respect their perspective, but at the same time, like when I look at my ability to live my life and be free, I can't live it based on the judgments of somebody that, that, uh, that I respect. And it's not so much that the judgments have to be something that shuts me down. Cause here's the truth of it. They may make some valid points. They might. And what's good about that is like, that means you have an opportunity to improve if you so choose. It also means you have the choice to do nothing with the insight and say, thank you respectfully. I, I respect you greatly. I don't agree with you, but I thoroughly respect you. I appreciate that insight. And now I get to walk away and do my thing. But man, it's, it's hard when, when people go and they idolize somebody mm. and they don't realize they're regular people. And they think that everything this person said is the truth and nothing but the truth. And I have to hold that, you know, I have to, to lose inside. And so for me, like I tell people, dude, at the end of the day, they are just humans. Take everything with a grain of salt. Also, the good stuff. If they come off and tell you, hey, you are the best, amazing, don't you get a big head. Again, it's just one person. You can feel you're amazing because Bob told you you're amazing, but you go somewhere else and somebody says you're nobody. And you go, but Bob said I am. Like, I don't know, Bob, I don't care about Bob. I'm telling you what I see, right? Then you get that weirdness. So I think most of the time people should stay pretty just even keel, man. Don't be like capricious, they call it, up and down. You just live. And it's great to feel great because an idol person you, you idolize likes you. But that's, I think, why Christ was really big on like, don't have an idol. Don't have, have no gods above me. Have no idols above me. 
And I think if we idolize other men or other objects, we, we are always setting up for recipe for failure because you're looking at it the wrong way. And honestly, no matter what the outcome is, if you idolize it, if it's a good feedback or bad feedback, no matter what it is, it never, it always goes in a funky spot because either I get a big head or too small of a head. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing that, that kind of ties back into self-worth and actually that identity where you're creating stuff within I said, brick by brick, building it. And mm -hmm. the, so the beauty of it is that, I mean, it's hard. And that's why not everybody does it, obviously. Uh, how do you actually kick off that journey? And what is necessary? Like, what kind of support? What do you think of, for yourself? I mean, I, I kind of see a lot of people online saying, I'm a self-made entrepreneur. That's bullshit. I was like, I don't trust that person. Like, if you're self-made, yeah. it's like, I, I, don't, I don't trust you. That's, that's a lie right off the gate. Because you, you have so many people who supported you. Nobody makes it makes that journey on their own. So yeah, nobody's yeah, you're right. I, I, I think there's this, yeah, there's something that has to do with I think people's desire to not have to give anybody else credit. When I used to own a gym years ago, I would train youth athletes and and I had no ties to any team. I just wanted to have kids be better athletes. And I had this one kid, Jesse, that I was training, and the kid was he got in great shape, phenomenal. In fact, he, uh, he now does personal training, good kid. And at one point I went to his high school cause I thought, man, I helped this kid. Coach is going to definitely want me to come help with the team. Uh -huh. So I go in there and I'm talking to a different teacher about something else. The head coach comes in cause he hears I'm in the area and I don't even know why he comes in. He comes in and he sits there with the principal and me and he goes, I'm talking about this kid, Jesse he goes, yeah, Hey, Jesse, 180 degrees. He's the fastest kid in the team. He's strong. He's quick. I don't know what you did. You did a great job, but I don't want you working with him anymore. I said, hold on. What? I, I thought I was joking at first. I'm like, ah, and he goes, no, I really don't. And I was like, why? He goes, I would much rather him be a lesser athlete, but only be part of my team than go anywhere else and get the help. Blew wow. my effing mind. Wow. And I, that was the, that was to be honest, the beginning of the end for me. Cause I realized why so many other coaches I tried to work with would never work with me. It was this mentality of, I don't want to have to give anybody else credit. I want it all. I got to be the one that did it. The dude didn't know what he was doing. He, he got fired a few years later, for like molesting little kids or like, like, like the girls at the school, weird stuff, weird stuff. Right. And it's nuts that I'm like, damn, like this is the, this is the mentality of a lot of human beings. So I think so many people have their personal pride and identity wrapped up in small things that, that they, they feel like if anybody comes in and takes any bit of the success, then it's, it's lackluster success. And every successful person I know, they're like, bro, I just want to win. Don't care how or who's with me. And in fact, when I do win, I want to celebrate with other people because it doesn't take from me. Bro, I got a team of like 11 people around me that makes this whole machine of Anthony Trucks Industries run. People think it's just me. It looks like it's me. It is not just me. But I'm, I don't care. I'll tell you openly. I can't make half the, the social media content make it look the way it looks. I can't make the website do what it does. I can't run the ads the way I do. Like there's so many nuances and all the funnel pieces and the technology I could do. I can't do it. I'm not one man. And if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have the success. So most people, they say self-made. All they want is a lot of nothing. Whereas I'm okay and happy with a little bit of a lot. And that's the mentality I think people who are self-made have. I want a lot of, 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 of whatever, but you don't have much, dude. Say that one again. Say that one again. That, that line. Yeah. It? People want a lot of a little bit. Instead of me, I want a little bit of a lot. I like it. I like it. That's on point. That's really good. So that's, was it Brian Tracy or um, Jim Rohn? I, I don't remember which one is like, there are two ways to have the tallest building in the, in the city. You either build the tallest building or actually demolish all the buildings that are yeah. taller than yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. true. Yep. I've so that's, that that's, that's, one of the, that's what it reminded me of. Uh, so yeah. brother, um, one of the things that I want to really tap into is trauma, because that's something that we all have. Most yeah. of us deny it and neglect. It's like there's trauma with, you know, a capital T and there's trauma with little T. We all, we all have it. It just, you can't, we can't negate that. Uh, how did you overcome that? What kind of work um, have you done in order to face it? Because obviously it lives within, within you. It's in your body. So yeah. transcending that. Most of them, again, uh, most people identify with it. They just kind of live with it for the rest of their lives and they never 
transcend that. What did you do to, to shift that, to change that? I mean, it's trauma is kind of this thing that you're always experiencing. I think it, it's a, uh, it, there's a statement I love and it says a smooth sea makes not a skilled sailor. And the way I've, I've always looked at that perspective is there, there is like this consistent, you know, waves of life. And I think some people, they aren't able to handle any waves because they never go out into the ocean. And for me, I learned to go out into the ocean. And when I went out in the ocean, I learned like how to navigate the seas. And essentially what it is, it's navigating the trauma, man. And, and trauma, I don't think like the things that cause trauma, they don't stop. It's just a matter of what's the relative damage to you. If I'm a dinghy in the ocean and a wave comes, it'll, it'll tear the boat to pieces. If I'm a battleship in the ocean, it's no problem. It's a matter of the relative size of my ability to handle that size wave. A little one, trash the boat. Little one, don't even notice it, right? What size ship are you? And I think the only difference in the size of the ship you are is how often you go out into the ocean and, and figure out how to navigate these waves. Like, it's mm -hmm. like you keep going out and getting better, getting bigger, getting better, getting bigger. And after a while, it's easy. And, and the thing that would shut somebody down, like, I'm like, bro, that, that, that I did that on Wednesday at five o'clock for 20 minutes. and I'm done. How are you still freaking out? I just, I don't know. You know, that happens for people. And so I respect that. And I get that. And the only thing that is, that happens as, as a process to move past in my life is I'm like, all right, let me take a look at this. And let me say like, first off, Where's my fault in this? Where can I take control? Because if you don't take ownership or control somewhere, you'll never actually finish the process. You'll blame it on something else. You'll sit back and wait for someone to fix it. But truth is, even if it's not your fault, it's still your, it's still your responsibility to fix it. Like right. no one's going to fix it for you. I think Mark Victor and Manson has a book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving F, talks about that. He's like, dude, at the end of the day, he's like, yeah, it may not be your fault, but ain't nobody fixing it but you, man. So fix it, right? Figure it out. And so when you notice, okay, I got to do this work, it gives you a different drive to solve it because you realize at this point, either you can complain about it or you can work on it. But the truth is, now that you know it's on you, if you complain about it, there's no way to blame but you because you already know it's on you and you aren't working on it. So if I choose and go, look, I'm going to work on this, what ends up happening is you start getting the strength to navigate these hardships. You start learning how to communicate differently, how to, how to have that pain threshold how to take tools you've learned from past situations and overcoming them and apply them to new situations. You start getting through these, these problems a lot smoother and a lot quicker. And then you also learn how to avoid those problems by doing things way early. So it never builds into what that is, right? It's like catching cancer early. I'm going to catch it back here, stop it here. So it doesn't turn into that. Cause I know if I don't, what it will come. So these little things over time, they become these, I think, skill sets. And so what's traumatic doesn't be, it's not as traumatic as a thing was previously because, well, you understand how to navigate these things. Will we have trauma? Yes. But I think even when we have hard ones, really big, difficult ones, the process we understand how to navigate. So if I've done it at a small level, I can do it at a higher level. It might be harder, but I'll know how to do it because I've done it before. Mm -hmm. And that, so that path, I want to hear about that path because again, navigating, navigating, you're, you're ultimately talking about building, the, building up the capacity. But sometimes, you know, when you're in it, when you're so in it and you just don't, you never mm -hmm. navigated it before, you never overcame it, you identify with it. So how do you, how do you leave that bubble? How would you pop it? Like leave the hardship bubble? Well, I, well one, I wouldn't do it alone. <laughs> I think that's the thing that we talked about self-made. You right. can't do it alone, man. You need to get support. You need to have people around you. I think the the more people you can get around you, the better it is because that what happens is you end up having other people to lean on to navigate problems you haven't navigated, but they have. Most of the time, people have gone through enough collectively to overcome stuff. That's why teams do so well because odds are one person in that team has done something remotely close or experienced something remotely close to this thing and can give some kind of insight. If not, then you're out there with one brain and one perspective and one set of experiences to solve multiple problems with a myriad of different solutions. And if you can go in there and say, I'm going to try to find a way out of this with help, like you'll find a faster way out. And then the big thing is like, commit to why I want to go. It's no different than anybody's heard. That's why the truthfully, a lot of the cliche things we hear, they're true. You have to have a big enough why. And I, I, I know someone's hearing it going, ah, oh, the why, I hear that again. Yeah, damn it. The, yeah, seriously, do you ever really think about it? Do you ever sit down in your head and come up with it so clear you can write it down? Most people don't. 
if, if you don't have a why that that um, it's so deep and dark and embarrassing that it's hard to share in public that you don't, you're scared to write down, you're not going to do enough when the moment comes because it's not you don't need it. You don't need it on the good days. Right. I don't think you need a why in the good days. I think that the good days, it's fine. You need a why at seven o'clock at night when your body hurts and you've had a long day and you're tired and you're hungry, but you have to get a workout in. You need your why then. You don't need it on the day with sunny and perfect and you get your workout done ahead of time because it's not that big a deal. That why is necessary and needed in the moment when you have to keep going when you don't want to. And that's why it's got to be something that's, that's not something that's easy to overcome or easy to look past. It's got to be something that drives you a little bit deeper. Hmm. That's something that I always go back to. If your why is not bigger than yourself, it's not big enough. So what's your hmm. why? My why? Ah, the thing, you know, honestly, it changes. I feel like it's a, it's a weird thing to say it changes. But what I've noticed is a lot of my whys are tied to like foster care. Mm -hmm. And so when I say why, the days that I want to get up, there's two things that are deeper whys. And there's deeper ones than this. But the first why is I came to this world and no one wanted me, not even my own mom. And the people who did take me and wanted the money that came with me. And I did not matter at all. And so my, one of my deep things is like, I want to leave this planet and have people like want to come to my funeral. I want them to go, this dude was a great dude. I'm coming to hang out. I know he's not there, but he's there, you know? So part of me is like, I really, really want to live a life where when I came in, I wasn't desired, but when I left, people loved me. So that for me matters. Mm. The second thing is I really want my kids to have a dad that whenever I am gone from this planet and somebody goes, Who's your dad? And they say, Anthony Trucks. I go, holy, that was a great dude. And my kids can feel proud knowing that was their pops. So those are my deeper ones. Now, all that stuff is, is ties to actions. One's actions of what I've accomplished, how I've served. The other one is, is actions of how I've handled life. Right. Because for, for, for someone to say your dad's a great dude, that means that they saw me interact in the world in ways to face difficulty, face hardship, to overcome, to do things that made them proud of me as a human. So they could tell my kids, you had a great dad. So there's a service side of it and an, and, and an action and managing life side of it. So when I get up on these days when, when it's long nights and I don't want to do anything and like I'm on this podcast, 630 at night, my time, and it's a long day already. I'm not getting on here for me. This isn't, this is legit. It's odd, but it's not, I'm not on here for me. I'm on here so that I can touch the person's life who will never see me. I'll never know they listen to this. I'll never hear their name. They'll never speak anything to me. They won't even send me a message, but they heard it. And later on when I go, they're like, that was a good dude. And maybe they come visit me at, at my funeral or at least watch the live stream because I'm assuming it'll be a live stream at that point. <laughs> Something. Man. I'm going to come. I'm going to come to your funeral. That's for sure. <laughs> I appreciate it, boss. Yeah. Well, that um, means I'm dying first, man. But I see what you're saying. <laughs> I don't know if you can. I mean, I'm looking to live until at least 150. I don't know if you I would you like to. Me. Bro, I'm, I'm talking about. Yeah, there, there we go. You. I hear that all the nowadays with the technology and stuff, there's, there's a good possibility that when like the singularity hits, they can like duplicate stuff easy. Like I'm going to have new, new earlobes whenever I have too many, too big a holes in my ear from piercing all that craziness. I'm making stuff up. <laughs> Man, that's, that's one of those things that, yeah. Uh, technology. We, we humans right now, we're looking to, to ascend ourselves is like the, the human meat suit. We think that we can actually out outsmart it, but man, mm -hmm. like one, one shape or form or another, we're going to, we're going to keep our mission. And uh, as you said, your message that something is bigger than yourself, your family is going to be carrying your, your legacy. So mm -hmm. living the life so we can actually leave something behind that is going to matter on that yeah. note, spirituality. What does that mean to you? You see, there's, there's a lot of misconception. There are a lot of yeah. um, just connotations they, they actually associated with, with religion, with what have you. What, what does that mean to you? Uh, spirituality, man, it's interesting. I, I think that we all have a spiritual base to us because I believe as a higher power. I believe in a God. I believe in a devil. I believe in all that kind of crazy stuff. That's not that crazy if you think about it. And, and I think within that aspect, when I think of spirituality, there, there is a, we live in a physical body. Right. And this physical body, we sense the world through senses. We have eyesight, taste, touch, um, feeling, and smell. What else do we have? Right there, I don't think there's anything else. And here's the thing is what, what bothers me is people saying, ah, there's no spiritual basis, no world. 
how if if i wanted to check the uh how much density of i don't know maybe how humid the air is with a thermometer could i do it couldn't do it it can't sense it the thermometer can sense how hot it is it can't it can't check the water in the air it can't sense it so in my head i'm like all right there's got to be something this isn't some weird you know accident we didn't crawl out of a puddle of mud that's just my perspective it's just too weird there's too the ability for me right now to vibrate things from my brain that goes to vibrate the, my lungs in my air out of my voice in a way that has it go through a microphone into your ears into your vibration to your head to make your brain think something that's an accident that's just weird to me that people go like oh we're just an accident so that's first but i'm like all right there's got to be something bigger which tells me there's something more which tells me that if you really think about it like there's parts of us i think that at certain levels we can kind of feel that other thing that our body is not designed to sense like we don't we are thermometers trying to measure humidity and it's not we don't have that so for me i'm like dude there there's something bigger better grander than us that's out there and so for me when i think of spirituality i think it's trying to find and connect to that and i think it's quieting the other senses i think we have like that there might be like a third eye there's something in there you know that sense we can feel right. it for random reasons we you know we feel things near i think that it, it catches it a little bit right? Because thermometer can sense the heat. That's probably tied to humidity a little bit. Like there's a little bit of there. So I think for us, that spiritual world exists. And I think we should spend some time respecting it. That's, I think it's the word that, that feels better, respecting it. Because to respect it means, I don't know for sure, yes or no, but you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat it with respect. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do things right, which means I'm going to live my life right. I'm going to try to, to serve that spiritual sense in part of me. Because here's the thing, it, it may not be able to sense it, but it affects me. The spirituality base affects if I feel anxiety or I feel off or I feel like funky, like I, I, there's something I can't put my finger on. It's there, man. So I respect it. And I do the things that in my head, this weird brain that named itself, I do the things I can to find a way to connect to that spiritual place that makes me feel more at ease. Mm, beautiful. That's, that's a great take. That's, that's the first time I actually heard that kind of explanation that's awesome that, that got me that got me thinking and then so there are usually two camps you see like one one camp that does not believe in it it's like yeah we just we're just humans that's it doesn't matter and the other camp that is completely out there it's like how do you bring those together to make that spirituality practical so you can actually yeah. bring it down and do the work at the same time where you as you said you respect it and yeah. you utilize it for because i know you're clearly you're clearly in the both in those bo both worlds you're hustling you're <clears throat> excuse me you're accepting and respecting that higher power so it's you're you're doing the work tell me how you navigate it um I'm, i set my own scale dude i do my own thing i think that's the thing is we're, we're all based in like my belief i think a lot of people have to have beliefs that they have to convince other people to believe for them to right. feel validated in their belief <laughs> yeah that's it I, I don't need anybody else to help me validate my belief. So I, I have yeah. friends that are like agnostic or friends that are atheists and that's cool as their prerogative. I don't feel bad that they don't believe in my belief. I don't even think that they are bad. They don't believe in it. I just realize like it fits for me. It doesn't for you. Let's keep eating burritos. <laughs> like I don't care. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think there are people that spend so much time trying to validate their own belief through the action of getting somebody else to believe it. Right. And I don't need that. So the, when I look at those people, like someone wants to be in that side of like way out there, cool. You want to think this doesn't exist? Cool. Here's what I know. I'm happy. I'm happy, man. I enjoy my life. I enjoy the people in my life. And I, I live in a good space. Now, for me, what works is a respect for a spiritual base, living in a certain way, doing certain things. And it works for me. Now, I find people that don't do the things I do and they're kind of in funky places. Like they're just, they're, they're strolling or stressed out or fighting for something. And what I find is like, for some people, my way helps them. For some people, my way doesn't. No one's right or wrong. It just is. Hmm. It just is, man. And so I don't spend time trying to make sense of how to convince other people. I'll share with them my reasons for myself, but I'm not in. A, I'm not doing it in a sense of trying to invalidate you or validate you. It's not. It's not an argument. It's not a discussion. I, I'm not. I, there's none of that. Like I'm not in a debate with you. I'm just sharing. Now, if you want to get in a debate, totally cool. I'll just stop talking because I. I don't feel like being in that space. I'm just sharing. But I'll also. Here's the thing. I'm also open to 
to listening. I believe the mark of a wise person is to be able to listen and entertain a concept or an idea without accepting it. And I think people, when they start entertaining ideas, they feel like, oh my gosh, this kind of makes sense and I might accept it. Shut up, you're wrong. And they walk away. It's like, dude, just <laughs> a moment to sit and breathe because there's a possibility it can add to your belief and it can help you in some way or give you a new perspective that makes you a little bit you know, more joyous, right? So there's a lot of nuances there. Like I'm okay in who I am, but I'm also okay in finding out if I can better who I am. Right. And that's, again, that's, that ties, ties that whole, whole loop together where identity, again, if you're holding on to a certain identity and you're not able to even, even entertain anything that's outside of it. I mean, you're, you're ultimately, I mean, you're not a complete human being and that's fine. That's fine. Because again, it's yeah. a choice. So it's a choice, man. Yeah, it's yeah. okay. We still love you. Yeah, we still love you, <laughs> man. Beautiful. And uh, I just, I, I love every time we have a conversation or we go down the rabbit holes. I, I really appreciate you. And um, you're, I think you're making to Bali sometime soon. It's like, I, I know you're like, just telling my wife that we got to get out there. We're just, she's like, what are you doing now? Like I got a podcast with who? I was like, well, AJ from Bali. Oh yeah, we got to go there. I said, yeah, we do. We do got to oh, go yeah. there. Yeah, but your, your schedule is packed. One, one last thing that I wanted to cover real quick is productivity. You are just a machine in terms yeah, of productive it. output. How do you do it? It's like, how, uh, what I would help? It. Leave something for people. Yeah. It's like that, is, that would help them to ultimately just become, become that. Become that productive yeah, machine, yeah. productive <laughs> output. There are levels to that. Pro productivity has a lot of levels in my world. I, here's the thing. I do a lot without stress. I don't have a lot of anxiety and I get a whole heck of, I get probably at minimum, at least like 75% more done than most people do in a day. And it's not a stress. I just do it. And one is I built up to it. I built the mental ability to focus that long. It's like a muscle. I have the neural pathways out of this time to focus longer than most people do. Cause there's points in time when you shut down and you just can't bring the brain back to work. It happens. Right. But that doesn't happen to me for like, it takes like eight to nine hours to get there. Whereas most people, they can get through two or three and they're smoked. And I'm mm -hmm. talking full focus, right? Two or three hours of full focus. I need, I need to have lunch. Give me a TV show. Let me sip some tea and watch it. You know, like they, let me meditate now. Like I'm not, I'm, a, I'm not against that, but if those people don't usually come back and dig back in. I can right. dig in, bro. I've done the stupid hours, right? That's the first piece of it. Secondly, I, I structure my life to flow. I structure it. And it's funny thing is most people think flow is non-structure. No, no, no. Flow means I'm moving in a good path and I feel like I'm in a groove. I'm in a flow. It's hard to do that if you don't have any kind of structure though. Like you I can get for it. You make space. I think space for it's a big piece of it. Yeah. But like we were talking about, I got like five, little, like five, what do they call them? Um, irons in the fire right now. I got like five really important things between speeches, new parts of the company coming on, a book coming out, curriculum I'm creating for approaching programs, content stuff. I got these things moving and a lot of people can't do one. I do all five and I'm still dad and I'm still husband. And I'm still a handyman for my wife's business and I get all this stuff done. And most people are like, bro, like, do you have a clone? How are you doing that? I'm like, a, it's not, if you think it's productivity, one, it's my identity. It's who I am. I built it up to that too. I spend time, like I was saying, I got these things going. I get to the point of feeling like I got a lot. So what do I do? I stop doing anything. People go, what do you mean you stop doing stuff? Well, I want to sharpen the ax. So what does he mean to sharpen the ax, Ant? Well, I just, I spend two or three days and I sit back and I look at all the projects. And I put them on paper. I take it all these, I put it down concrete and I take it, say, what are the steps to get every one of these done individually? If I broke it into the most minuscule micro actions and I look at all and I, I break them out. Some may be 50 steps. I've had 60 step processes sometimes. That may be six, 60, 15 minute things, you know? but I've got it all broken down. Okay, cool. Now what I do is go, okay, let me infuse this into my calendar after I've already put in my life, my workouts, my family, my, right? All that kind of stuff. And I'll find those nooks after it's all in there. But then I start dropping this stuff in here and I'll get all five put in over like 90 days. And what's crazy is I get it done in 90 days or less. But had a schedule because every day when I showed up, the only thing I had to stress about was that thing for the day, not everything for the day. So when I was working, I was clear. I was more focused. I got it done. I got it done by 10 o'clock in the morning. Mostly we're freaking out. You could do so much more. Yeah, I can. And I'm going to do it in the 90 day period, but I'm not going to freak out now because it's going to be halfway work, unfocused, rushed. But if I just tick away at it the way I'm supposed to, I get to live and experience my life in real time 
not, I got to wait for two months and hang up my wife again. No, I'm having date nights. We're living life. But at the end of 90 days, it's all done. And mm-hmm. people think it's magic. It's not. It's a structure. Right. It's just most people underestimate how much they can get done in like a month and overestimate how much they can get done in a day. And that's what causes anxiety. And then, mm-hmm. as you said, just breaking it down, breaking it down, putting it to your schedule. It's that, yeah. it's that freaking simple. Yeah, man. I get uh-huh. it. That makes sense. I, I might reverse that. I, I probably overestimate what I can get done in like 90 days and underestimate what I can get done in a small amount of time. Because for me, like I, I, I look at something I say is like, oh, it's 15 minutes. I'm going to do it. It takes 30. But I, I have buffers and I create a structure. And I'm always trying to find out what can I really get done in those small amounts of time in pockets. And then like 15 minutes holds incredible value for me. Mm. Most people go, um, 15 minutes. Uh, I don't have time to do anything. But 15 minutes, I can get through like 20 emails. I get it done. So those emails that keep piling up that people go, oh my gosh, I got 60 emails. Yeah, but it's probably like 20 minutes, man. Just sit down and do the damn emails. And then here's the thing. Now the emails aren't on your head. You have space that's free. You can work on that creative project you want to create. You can work on something that speaks to your heart a little bit more because you, you mm-hmm. took the weight out of the boat. But most people keep letting weights pile up in the boat and they, they, they get sunk. They, they top turn over. You had too many little things hanging. You didn't do anything when you hit in the little 15, 20 minute spaces. So I'm always shoveling things out of the boat. So the boat's never weighed down. So when something big comes, I'm like, ooh, I got space for it. Beautiful. Man, as you guys can see, Anthony is a beautiful human being. He is, he's, he's got a lot of wisdom and I can't wait to see him here in Bali. He keeps, yeah. he keeps delaying it. He keeps, he keeps push, pushing it back. We got oh, to schedule it in. Yeah, we got to schedule it and bring you out here. Yeah. So Matt, where, where do people find you? What is an exciting project that is coming up? Uh, where can they find you? Where they, can they get inspired by you? Where can they work with you? like in some shape or form or capacity? Yeah, um, it's easy, man. If you guys want to find out um, how we do, we do. Because all the things I talk about, I actually have a very refined process called the shift method. To find out more about that, just go to trucksteam.com. The team talks you through the entire process and how it works. And if anybody wants to have an amazing achievement and a powerful permanent transformation in 90 days, that's what we do. Like that is the goal for us to have you make an identity shift while accomplishing something cool. Outside of that, go to Anthony Trucks on Instagram and you'll find me floating around there all the time. Yeah, a lot, a lot of good stuff, a lot of good content. Uh, he, he definitely has. It's entertaining. It's, it's powerful. <laughs> it's energetic. It's always, it's always something. It's always something. It's always something, man. All right, brother. I appreciate you immensely. Uh, again, we can't wait for you to come, come out to Bali. We got a, yeah. or yeah, hey, we got maybe some, we got September, some stuff to do. We're gonna put in the cold. We're gonna put you in the cold in the in the freezer and jump off the cliff. Yeah, <laughs> I played. I played the NFL, bro. We used to ice bass twice a day. I've been there. We're good. It count good, me man. in. Though. Good man. All right. I appreciate you. Thank you for coming on. And yeah, talk to you soon. All right, man.